All right, good morning, friends. It's uh, Monday, brand new week, and uh, looks to be a good one on uh, on on the schedule and calendar. Um, weather-wise, looks like it's going to be good for a few days. 80, it's going to hit 80 here. That makes me happy. Um, and uh, it's just going to be a productive week, right? Not just not all about the weather. I just think we're going to have a, a good week. And I uh, hope you're doing well. Hope your weekend was good. Uh, man, we had a... Uh, we had a great weekend at um, at this house and just hung out and I did a little uh, writing. I've got a uh, I'm, I'm scheduled to be a speaker at a conference next week, pretty large uh, deal, and so uh, you know requires me to do a little more work uh, just to make sure because they give me a, a very specific allotted time and so uh, doing that and I'll be doing that next next Sunday. I'll be speaking in Columbus, Ohio, and. Uh, now I'm looking forward to that. So that's what's going on in my world. And uh, today we're uh, looking at uh, looking at some good truth in the book of First Peter. And so uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm, I'm gonna kind of review real quickly and then jump into the final section of chapter two. Is he's talking about suffering. So um, it's it's a it's just powerful truth all the way through this scripture as it relates to suffering. Now. Um, Persecution's coming. I don't think it's here yet. Not here. It's in the world, and a lot of our brothers and sisters are um, of suffering uh, persecution for for Christ, for just being godly, for being a Christian, for being a Christ follower. Um, here in America, you can see pockets of it, can't you? Um, we see it here and there, um, and we're ridiculed for our stance on on certain things, and. Um, but as far as like having to endure loss of job and things like that, I maybe in, in pockets. Uh, but hang on, because it's coming. Uh, whether we see it or our kids or our grandkids see it, uh, it, it's on its way. And so to Peter, he's writing to a group that is already incurring great persecution simply for being Christ followers. And so uh, Peter is a couple of years, I'm going to say it again, just every week we start off this way. Peter's writing this letter uh, somewhere late 60s uh, AD, 60 AD, and uh, Rome has already burned, and Nero has blamed the Christians for it, and uh, the Christians who had fled Jerusalem because of the Jewish persecution are now it's scattered into Rome and their province and colonies, and now they're enduring persecution for the sake of being a Christian from both the Jews and uh, the Romans or Gentiles, if you will. And so that's what's going on. And it's in, it's increased persecution. Uh, they are already being uh, martyred, and that will continue. And Paul, I mean, Peter is a few years away from losing his own life, and uh, so this is this is where he finds himself. So he's writing to them to remind them of the end game and to say, look, life in this place is going to get hard. And when it does, you focus on the end game. You focus on the fact that that there is a heavenly city and that that's where we're going and that we're strangers and aliens here. We no longer belong here. Our home, our citizenship is in heaven. There we have a royal priesthood. There we, we, we are a chosen race. There is our savior. There is this city where we'll flourish. There is the government that is just and right. There is a place where sin is no longer a temptation to us. And so he reminds us of that as a way to encourage ourselves when when hard times come. So then he said, okay, so so how do we how do we thrive in a hostile environment? And that's what we're looking at. How do we thrive in a hostile environment? Now, I, I would say our environment is hostile today, right? Um, in the Bible belt where we are, maybe there's still, you know, some pockets of uh, where, where there's not, but for the most part, even around our country, there's, there's hostility toward, toward the gospel. We're seen as backwoods and, um, and people who want to suppress others and, and impose our, our rules on them and all of those things. And so, uh, Peter is addressing this and he's had three movements so far, uh, in that section in, uh, verse 11 and 12. It, his first thing is that, Hey, how do we, how do we live in a hostile world? Well, we, we live sinless lives. We 
we do the right thing. That's, that's what he said in verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may accuse you of, doing, of wrongdoing. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And so uh, they're saying there, hey, listen, let's just live sinless lives. The best way to respond to a hostile world is, is to simply be good holy people. That's the first thing. Then he says, and then you need to submit to every human authority uh, for the Lord's sake. And on behalf of the Lord, submit. Whether it's an emperor or in our place, a president, a governor, uh, a mayor, we just submit. Police, we we do the right thing. How do we respond? Even if even if we've done nothing wrong, how do we respond? With respect. Right. This, this is how he he reminds us that we do those things. And then thirdly, he said, and then when you get to the place where uh, your position in life. So if you're a slave and you have a master, well, then you you submit to that. You don't fight against that. You don't rebel against that. You just submit to that. So we translate that today because there's not a lot of that overt slavery happening in our world today. More, It's more underground. Um, and, and a different flavor, sex trafficking and, and all of those things. But, but for you and me, uh, it would it manifests itself in the sense if I have a boss and he, whether he, he or she is a, a good person or not, I submit, I'm respectful, I, I do over and above what they want. That's the best way to silence the critics, to muzzle them. And it's the best witness for the gospel of Christ. And so, um, all, all, this is this is what he's saying. Only time's going to tell. Uh, um, when we're only the only time we we do um, rebel against authority is when this they tell us to do something that the scriptures tell us we can't do. That's that's the that's the bottom line. We obey up until the point where they ask us to disobey the Father. And at that point, we stand firm in that, but we're still respectful in the process. That's how Peter, that's how Paul, that's how those guys were. Now, today, we look at our example, and we kind of hit on it uh, last uh, Friday, but we're, gonna, we're just going to kind of pick it back up today. Uh, he says, as our example, verse 21, to this you were called to do what? To suffer. You and me were called to suffer. Jesus told us that. In this world, you will have tribulation. Uh, they, they hated me. They're going to hate you also. This is, Jesus was very upfront about that. If you follow me, you should expect persecution. If you follow me, understand that even the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, it's just going to be a hard life in the sense of, of how the world will treat us if we live a godly life. And so he says, just expect that. And then he gives us this example to this. You were called, he says to this suffering for the, for the sake of Christ. We're here. To be a witness. That's why we're still here. If it was just about getting our little selves into heaven, as soon as we came to Christ, wouldn't we just head to heaven? We're here because he says, you will be my witnesses, right? So we're here to be light unto a dark world. We have a purpose here to do the good works that God's called us beforehand that we should walk in. All of those scriptures make sense to us when we see it that way. So then he says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so we're going to see three things. He lived a sinless life, yet suffered greatly. Just like what he's calling you and me to do, to live a sinless life. He's saying, now, Jesus did that. Look what it says in verse 22. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. What, what do we know about that? What do we know about Jesus? He suffered greatly. Was he guilty of any crime by the Roman government? By any government? No. Did he sin? No. Was he disrespectful? Did he upset someone because he gave them no respect? No, because he did all of those things. The only crime was he lived a holy life. That was his crime. And that made the world feel guilty. And they didn't want, they felt like that maybe he was trying to usurp and set up some sort of kingdom on earth and so they attacked him but what the scriptures are clear he suffered for who for you and me he that was his reason so why do we endure suffering today for for ourselves no for god's glory but for other people 
to, to be an example to others, to draw people in. There's something powerful about watching someone who bears up under injustice in a holy way that makes you want to know what's going on in them. We become a witness in that sense. So we follow him in his sufferings. And so when hard times come and hostile times come, we draw on this example of Christ who suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his steps. And so now he's going to tell us how do we act in this hostile world? So we get to verse 23. He says, when they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. Now, I don't know about you, but it feels like I've been given this gift of sarcasm, right? And so you start hurling accusation at me, my go-to is to begin to move into some sarcasm. Um, but but that, that goes against what the scripture says. The scripture says, what do we do when the, her insults are hurled at us? We don't retaliate. We just take it. Man, that's hard for an old selfish, sinful person, isn't it? That's why you and me need change. We need more of the Holy Spirit uh, to be a alive in us. And so then he says, um, he says, when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. So when they verbally abused him, he didn't jab back at them. He just simply spoke truth. And when they physically assaulted him, he didn't retaliate. He didn't go, hey, hit me, I'm going to hit you back. Hit me, I'm going to hit you harder. He, he didn't say that. He simply said, he, uh, he made no threats. He didn't say, hey, you just wait. It's, you're going to get yours. He didn't say any of that. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. What did he do? He hid under the sovereignty and goodness of God. He go, okay, I'm going to bear up underneath verbal assault, physical assault, I'm not retaliating, because I trust God the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, to rightly judge my life. I think there's a case to be made in the Scriptures that the more suffering we endure, uh, the more glory that we receive when we get to heaven. And that's, that's, the, that's the call. There's a crown for martyrs, and there's a crown for those who endure unjust suffering. And so there's more glory that happens in heaven as that comes our way. And so Jesus knew that, and he's saying, and you should know that. Then it says, and he now he moves into just talking about the cross. And he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Uh, so he, he endured those things for our sake. And then he bore the sins, ultimately of all the whole world, on his body on the cross. For what reason? That you and I might die to sin and live for righteousness. That we might not sin and we might be holy. That's why he bore... Uh, the sin on the cross for the same reason, to give us the position that we're in right now where we don't have to sin and we can be holy. Before the cross, we didn't have a choice. We were trapped in our sin. But the cross removed the power and the penalty of that sin so that now we can be holy. And, and at the resurrection, the grave was, was beaten. The spirit was placed within us who leads us into holiness. And so, so this is the whole point of the gospel, was to give us the ability to do what he's calling us to do now, to not sin and to be holy. Then he, said, he, then he borrows the phrase from the scriptures that says, by his wounds you have been healed. Now here it's classic understanding of that text. A lot of people say, uh, by his stripes we are healed, and they mean physically. And, and while that is true, Ultimately, when we make it to heaven, our bodies are glorified. Doesn't mean that physically in this life we will see that. Uh, Paul reminds us that though the outer body is decaying, inwardly we're being renewed. Right. So there is this uh, there is this healing that comes spiritually, and this is what the the text the prophet meant when he wrote that. By his stripes we are healed. He meant by the by the woundings of Christ, by the, by the crucifixion of Christ, we found spiritual healing, wholeness. Physical, yes. Uh, guaranteed in this life, no. Now, <clears throat> that may mess with you a little bit, but go study. You'll find for yourself that to be true. Then, <clears throat> then he says, 
Uh, for you are like sheep going astray. Now here, Peter must have just finished reading Isaiah because he's quoting Isaiah all through the scriptures, uh, all through this passage here. For you like sheep are going astray. Remember Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all on him. Man, the prophet Isaiah nailed what was going on at the cross, not knowing what he was speaking fully when he did that. He just knew there would come uh, a, 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 a true sacrifice, the Messiah, and he would do that for us. And so he says, for you like sheep are gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. That shepherd, when, G when Jesus says he leaves the 90 and 9 and goes to the one to bring him back, this is what he's referring to. He went to the cross like the shepherd so that he could bring the one back. So he went to that cross to bring you back. The shepherd of our souls went after us, bore our sins, bore our stripes, uh, his the, the stripes, so to speak. For, for a shepherd, it would mean he endured the attacks of the wolves to keep that wolf from attacking the sheep. This is what he did. He, he bore our sins on the cross. Uh, and so that we would return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. See, it is, it's so beautiful, that picture of the shepherd overseeing my soul, the whole care of my life. That's what Jesus did. And so it's funny to me to see Peter move from talking about suffering. Then he just gets caught up in the whole gospel thing and goes, man, this is, it's overwhelming to him. And this is the message that he's given to us. So how do we buck up underneath suffering as a Christian? Well, the same way Jesus did. We live a sinless and perfect life. We don't retaliate. And we trust the Savior of our souls that he will make all things right in his time. So, man, this is beautiful stuff. Now, we're going to move tomorrow into marriage. So um, it, get ready because tomorrow we're going to talk to wives. And then um, uh, to Wednesday, we're going to talk to men and talk about this whole thing of submission. He's all on submission right here. Submit to authorities, uh, governments. Submit to uh, uh, your, your workplace submit to Christ. Now he's going to say, hey, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, submit to your wives. And so that's how it's going to go. Love you guys. Hope you all have a great day and I will see you tomorrow.